Today and next Sunday, we're looking at a message titled, The War of 2024. You know, like the War of 1812? Well, the War of 2024. What, what could this possibly mean? Well, church, we're going to get ready for it, and by God's grace, we're going to be victorious through it. And uh, we're going to read a section of scripture, but we're going to really dial down these next uh, two weeks on 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, verse uh, 21. But let's start in verse 14. I'll read verse 14. If you'll read verse 15 uh, down to 21, here we go. Now, this is Paul the Apostle speaking. Now, we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things, hold fast what is good. Verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated, church. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be dialing down on verse 21 throughout the course of this next two weeks. As we look to the message, the war of 2024, and I have no inside track. I don't think anybody does anymore on, on what's, what could be, what's coming up. I think the world appears to be uh, in, in what uh, the world might say or consider a state of free fall. It's a very, very interesting dynamic that's happening globally. For the believer, it's the exact opposite. Everybody, please remember this. Nothing, according to the Bible, and nothing for the believer is falling apart. You need to know this. If something is falling apart in your life as a believer, it's because you haven't applied God's word to it. Okay, But everything is falling together according to God's will in this world. The world sees itself falling apart. The world is getting desperate. The world is panicking. The world is seeing no way out. By the way, Jesus said there'd be this very time that would visit or commence in the world scene or on the world scene. But as things look to be falling apart for the believer, and I want to make this very clear, that for the believer things are coming together. Because they're coming together as the Bible says. I was quoted recently in some publication. I'm not going to give you the, the, the name of them just because I don't want uh, them to uh, have any uh, acknowledgement. But um, they made a comment about how me and a few others um, are, are excited about the war in Israel. That we're happy about that. That we're happy about Russia attacking Ukraine and Russia threatening Europe right now. And they had a whole story about this. And uh, I read that for a few moments, and then I frankly, I just, I just clicked off of it. Because it took me a few moments to, to, to see right then and there, this is a bunch of baloney. What they don't understand is, none of us revel in evil, death, mayhem, or war. But here's what people cannot tolerate is that if you have an answer to what's going on, and they don't, that's unacceptable to them. If you say to them, we need to get ready, we need to pray, we need to have faith in Jesus, and we need to be looking up, that convicts them. Are you hearing me? It convicts them, and they don't want to hear from you. And so the only way that they can cope with you is by lab labeling you. And so uh, I and a few others are warmongers. Uh, my friend Tony Perkins was thrown into that group. Secretary Mike Pompeo was thrown into that group. We're warmongers. Why? Oh, because you see everything through the lens of Scripture. Guilty as charged. <laughs> Hallelujah. May that always be the case. You don't see things through the lens of the Scriptures, my friends, and you're going to be bouncing off the walls all the way to the end of days, and that's not God's will for your life. No, the truth of the matter is there's going to be the war of 2024. And I'm not talking about bombs, guns, and missiles. I'm talking about an all-out war on everything. From the spiritual realm, which is invisible, but certainly to the physical world in which things manifest. So um, throughout this 
next few weeks, I'm going to be making references to notable moments, perhaps, I would say, uh, in warfare or in war history or what is called the art of war. In fact, um, some of you may want to get this book if you want. I mean, check it out. I think it's awesome. But um, uh, the first quote is this, and I want, I want you to see this regarding what we as the believers should take away. Now, before I, but listen, before I give you all of this stuff, I want you guys to know as Christians, listen, I would like to say, if you want to be involved in ministry, read this non-Christian book. <laughs> see, how dare you endorse a non-Christian book? Listen, this is a brilliant, brilliant work, and it's by Patrick Van Horn and a couple of other guys. It's, the title of the book is Left of Bang, the Marine Corps' Combat Hunter Program. You need to read the book if you're a Christian. This year. This year. Why? Look what he says. This is a quote. Learning is impossible without humility. We encourage confidence, not cockiness. This is what he says, instructing and schooling Marines who are going to be deployed to the world to find and to hunt down terrorist activity or enemy activity before it happens. That's why it's called left of bang. Are you tracking with me? Left of bang means you find the enemy and you detect the enemy by how they're acting, what they're saying, and what they're doing, how they're posturing themselves before they do the bang. And if you're left of bang, that means you catch them before they do evil. Every pastor should read this book. That's what pastors are supposed to be doing. And now Christians, dads, moms, husbands, wives, the Christian community in your town, in your city, in your place, we need to be just like this. It needs to be the Christian's version of the combat hunter program, meaning we are now looking for evil and we are ready because we live in evil times. And there's nothing depressing about that. In fact, I'll argue with you that it's invigorating. But if the United States Marine Corps that defends the United States and other nations are taught this discipline, how much more we who deal with eternal things? Very important. The next quote is from Sun Tzu, and that is The Art of War. You can, this is a very small book. It's extremely ancient, but it's awesome. And that is, Vic, victorious warriors win first. They win first. Before I read any further, doesn't the Bible says the battle belongs to the Lord. the Lord? Doesn't the Bible tell us that God has already predetermined the outcome of the war that you and I are involved in? Well, Sin Tzu says, victorious warriors win and then go to war. Think of that for a moment. Jesus said that. Jesus said nobody goes to battle unless they first figure out that they can win the war. While defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. What a tremendous attitude. Christian, I want to encourage you this year. According to the Bible, you and I are going to go to war and the Lord is our commander in chief. He's the captain of the Lord's host, the Bible says. And that the outcome has already been determined by whatever you and I come up against this year. In whatever scenario. From this moment on, I want all of you, and I told you, I, I don't remember what message it was. It seems like it's all a big blur right now, but it was either New Year's Eve or, or, uh, or I don't know what it was, but I had challenged you that this year of 2024, I was going to throw off any restraint and just absolutely prepare you for the days that are coming, even if this church dwindles down to 10 people. I just want them to be the, the healthiest spiritual 10 people ever. I'm not, I don't care anymore about, about growing a big church. I've never cared. By the way, know this. Big church, big problems. Okay? But to God be the glory. Big church, big opportunity to do big things. But having said that, I've lived through that already. And I'm here to tell you right now. As we go into the war of 2024, I am 100% committed to mine and to your spiritual development and nothing else. Whatever it takes to get you and I stronger in Jesus is what we're going to be doing. And many of you, listen, I'm not a prophet, but many of you will not be able to put up with this year. And this is by design. If you say, that's it, I've had enough. I want you to know you are part of the fruit of the plan. If you say, I don't want to be that serious about Jesus, 
there's the door. You know why? We're, we're on our way to heaven, and we want to bring as many men and women and boys and girls with us. And this world is not our home. And if you think it is your home, you're in the wrong place. Because listen, we are on a mission and we are in a war. And this year of 2024 will be unlike any other year previously lived in your lifetime. A little bit of housekeeping for a moment. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. I told you it's our theme verse. Look at the word test. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. The word test means to approve of by holding up to the light. You ever do that? Maybe you're looking at something. Have you noticed when you hand somebody a $100 bill, if you have a $100 bill that you have not sent to the government in your taxes now, if you happen to have one, and have you noticed the, the retailer or the storekeeper will hold it up to see if it's for real? What are they looking at? They're looking at it and through it. The Bible says, hold it up to the light this year. Hold it up to the light. To examine in the light, to confirm the authenticity of something by exposure to scrutiny. That's a good thing. Judge it. Hold it up to the light. And then the words combined, uh, combined it's one Greek word, but it's all things. And the Greek word is P-A-S, pas. And it means this, as in all kinds. Watch this. So test, put to the scrutiny, hold up to the light of exposure, all kinds, all men, all respects, all angles, all possibilities, all situations. Example given, the etymology of the word sincere, meaning without wax. Did you know when you sign your name, sincerely uh, Judy or sincerely Lisa or sincerely Jack, do you know what you're saying? You may not be aware of this. You're saying, this has been written to you and I have said these things to you without any wax. And you put your name. You say, what in the world does that mean? In the ancient days, people would buy idols and little gods to worship. And sometimes if you were selling gods uh, and idols and one of the gods fell off the cart and broke its head, you would put it back on and you would heat it up with wax. You would glue it back together and then you would paint over it and sand it and all that stuff. And you would sell it. It's faulty, but nobody knows it. So the the worshiper buys the, the statue of, of Zeus and on the way home, if that statue's head is hanging out of his little shopping bag and the sun heats up the wax, the head falls off. It means that it was insincere. When something's insincere, you take it back and you go for the original. When you say this is true, you say sincere. It means I've spoken this without hypocrisy, without any wax. Put it to the heat, put it to the test. I mean it. That's what he's saying. Test all things. Examine all things. See if it's real. And then he says, uh, hold fast. Hold fast. The word means to hold firmly. Listen, to grip. It means to bind yourself to or to it. To possess, to restrain by never letting go. We would use the term death grip. I'm not sure if you're familiar with a death grip. It's, it's an actual, it's not only a term, but it actually happens. Um, I had a friend of mine whose father was dying, and he was holding her arm, and he died holding her arm, and uh, her arm was bruised for over a week from the grip of his uh, passing. He was holding on so strong. And that's the term death grip, according to the Bible. We are to have a death grip on the word of God, on the promises of God this year. Determining, I'm going to take a death grip on the Bible. I'm not going to let go. And then the word good, kalo or kalos, is the Greek word. It means beautiful. The better thing, the best, what is excellent, that which is of the highest value or character. The wise choice, to choose the best of the best. The wise choice is to uh, do what's the, the elevating or the, 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 high, the high bar choice. So let me read it to you in, in, a, uh, in, in an amplified way. 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Hold up to the light every single thing that comes into your life and take a grip that you will never let go of regarding all or anything that is good. 
That's what we're going to do in 2024 as we go into this war. Number one, mark it down. Don't worry, everybody. There's something like 15 or 16 of these. This is number one, but we'll only get through a few of them today. We'll save, save the rest for next week. I promise not to abuse you. The war of 2024, number one, is and will be against the truth. That's a no-brainer, but please write it down. I want all of you to write this down. Put it in your journal. Uh, take, take photos, whatever it, whatever it takes. Just remember this, because to be armed, to be knowledgeable, is to be practicing what the world is very proficient at, and that is left of bang, or the art of war, is to know what's coming up ahead so that you know what to do. The war in this 2024 year will be against the truth. No doubt about it. Jesus said in John 18, 37, Pilate therefore said to him, Jesus, are you king then? Remember, Jesus was on trial. And Jesus answered and said, you say rightly that I'm a king for this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world. That I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? You can hear that in his voice. Pilate could have said, really, so you're that big of a deal, Jesus? Um, I don't hear your voice. I mean, I hear your mouth moving, but I don't understand a word you say, Jesus. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't say, what, are you calling me deaf, Jesus? Is that it? He didn't say that either. He could have. Pilate said, what's truth? And if you think about that for a moment, think about the pain behind that question. Think about the confusion behind the question. Think about the disillusionment behind the question in life. Have you come to that place in life, and maybe you have, and now, listen, life has been in such a state for you that you, you've got your arms folded, the wall is built up 10 feet high in front of your heart, and you say things like, what is truth? What is true these days? Now, we've got to all watch out, everybody. In the midst of argument number one, we've got to guard our hearts that we do not become cynical and bitter because it's going to be really, really easy to do because we don't know who's telling us the truth or who's, who's lying. We don't know nothing anymore. Misinformation is everywhere. We'll talk more about this in a moment, but the war is against the truth. And even Pilate, it's always been the case, but even Pilate says, what is it? A lot of people today are saying, what is it? What is truth? And then when you tell them truth, I think we're further beyond Pilate's day in in Rome 2,000 years ago. When you tell somebody the actual truth, they don't believe it. And it's not that they're being mean about it. It's that, why should I believe that? Because I've just heard 10 other things. That's the world we live in today. We're at war, and it's all going to heat up. This is the perfect storm. I don't mean to be funny. In fact, I'm going to say some things today that you might be tempted to either laugh or get angry at, and I don't mean any of that to happen to you. So I'm just telling you right now in advance. We are entering a year of war in various parts of the world. Did you see Kim Jong-un a few days ago? What did he do? He launched rockets into South Korea. Do we not know this in America? I don't watch American news. I watch all... all, Did you know that? Anybody know that? You did? Do you know that? That guy's stirring it up, man. You want to know why? Because he can. China's stirring it up. Turkey's stirring it up. Nations are stirring it up. What's going on? Somebody will say something. Somebody will claim this. Somebody will claim the other. Dear friends, it's just absolutely gotten to the point where there's a war on truth to the point where you better stick to knowing and reading the truth and don't don't journey out into no man's land where you can't prove what it is you're reading. Well, I read the Wall Street Journal. Stop! (laughs) Well, I watch this. I have to be careful now because some of the... Some of the uh, networks uh, of TV carry us on Sunday morning, so I don't want to say everybody. (laughs) Hey, if they're crazy enough to put us on, we'll go on. (laughs) But uh, some of the, I'm telling you, you don't know. And then they show the video clip, 
and it's AI doctored up. You don't know? Remarkable stuff. Well, you know, I read. Mm, first warning. Say, Jack, man, what are you doing then? You're telling me I, I, I can't. Are you telling me that I can just trust the Bible? Well, I know this. A whole lot of people for thousands of years have gone on ahead of us to try to blow the Bible up, and they haven't been able to find one boo boo in it yet. So that's not a bad place to start, is the Word of God. But I want to give you this, uh, I just want to read this to you publicly, and it's this. Jesus Christ is the embodiment of the truth and all that is true. All truth belongs to God, and there is no other truth on the market. Should anyone say, this is my truth, or, well, that's just your truth, they have denied the fundamental reality of what truth is. It is an absolute attribute of God. Not us, God. And without God, it is a falsehood, a counterfeit reality. It's to pretend. Well, this is my truth. Are we not hearing this today? Well, that's my, that's your truth. Isn't that the gospel of Oprah Winfrey? That's her gospel. That's your truth. But I have a different truth. This is very popular today among humanists. And maybe you're somebody here today, or maybe you're watching right now, and you have fallen into that deception where you use that very terminology, well, I just follow my truth. You have been deceived and quite possibly beyond hope. May God have mercy on you. Because that is to say, I'm in charge. I know what's right. I know what's true. And even though my position differs with that of God in the Bible, I'm going to go with my way. And do you know what you're announcing? You're announcing what Eve was pursuing in the garden. I want to be like God. And where did she get that from? From Satan himself, who said in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28 in the Old Testament, I want to be like God. Anybody who comes along and says, you want to be a God? You need to slam the door at him. So what, what can be done about it, you might ask? This is what you can do about it. This is the application. Are you ready? Are you guys okay? Yes. So this is the application to number one. So okay, truth is going to be attacked in 2024. What do I do about it? So what? Well, here it is. It's 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 and 21. In fact, I'm going to read it to you in two different versions. First is the King James, because it is awesome. Watch this. Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings. Oh, that just sounds sarcastic. I just love the way that sounds. You're nothing but a profane and vain babbler, you are. And oppositions of science, falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Here it is in the exact pendulum swing opposite is the New Living Translation. O oh, Timothy, guard what God has entrusted to you. Avoid godless, foolish discussion, discussions with those who oppose you with their so-called knowledge. It's good stuff, huh? Verse 21, some people have wandered from the faith by following such foolishness. Do we not know people that have fallen victim to this war? Wow. Number two, everybody, mark it down. The war of 2024 is this. It's against the facts. You say, isn't the truth and the facts two different things? Not necessarily. They incorporate one another. First of all, uh, truth is unwavering and eternal, and it's an attribute of God. Facts is the reporting of what is observed, heard, seen, experienced. It's the reporting of what happened. Listen, the facts to a situation simply means this, that you're telling the truth, and you might be telling the truth regarding something that is very bad. Are you hearing me? I saw him shoot her. That is a very, very tragic thing, and, it's, and murder is against the truth, but the fact is he saw her, you see, as a witness. We need to understand that. Okay, now uh, here's where you're going to, I'm going to tell you right now, I love you. <laughs> I just love you so much that I want you to know the truth, and I've already rehearsed this in my head, and I just thought, yeah, ushers, I usually say ushers lock the doors. Ushers can, can open the doors for this one, you know? 
people are going to want to run. <laughs> so when we talk about facts, there are, are terms and there are words like facts, data, information, here's a whopper, misinformation, yeah. research, experts. And I quote now, fact-checking. This is, listen, fact-checking, fact-checkers, a data-driven approach. In a 22-page research article published by the Harvard, okay, well, that's, we've read enough. <laughs> now it's a comedy skit here. The Harvard Kennedy School, seriously? Misinformation review? <laughs> that's what they have time to do now? Okay. Examined practices of U.S. fact-checking organizations, Snopes, is that how you say it? I, don't, I won't even go to their website. How do you say it? You don't even know. Some said Snoops, some said Snopes. Let's call them dopes. The dopes and PolitiFact, Logical, or Logical, yeah, Logical, never heard of them, and Associated Press, those guys we've heard of. A near unanimous agreement of dopes and PolitiFact is what researchers found. Stop right there, everybody. Do you know how to unpack these things? When, we, when we're, as a Christian, when we're reading anything, I don't care if it's a cookbook, who's, who's, who's reading the, who is this? I, I, can't, I can't go any further. You want to know why I can't go any further? Who are the researchers who came to this conclusion? Who are they? I don't know who they are. What worldview do they have? Who do they work for? Who signs their check? What's, what's their personal agenda on things? I don't know. You don't know. Watch this. What researchers found likely means, oh boy, likely means that fact-checking is complex and multifaceted. I feel I, I can hear an excuse coming. Involving numerous variables. You know what that means? It means nobody knows nothing about it. <laughs> and that fact-checkers select and verify claims. Wait, select? Radar on full alert. <laughs> Who's doing the selection? Fact checkers. Who are these people? You'll never know. They select and verify claims in their own unique ways. <laughs> when multiple fact checking organizations consistently agree, <gasps> a group consensus, mob rule. When they consistently agree on the accuracy of a statement, the public is more likely to trust their assessments, the researchers concluded. Interesting, interesting. Translation. If we can all in this business sound like we have corroborated and come to the same conclusion, no matter what the real data is, because we have an agenda, because we're all paid by George Soros, <laughs> then what's cool about it is, the, the, poor, the poor person on the other end reading, there, there's going to be a high probability they're going to believe us. <laughs> because there seems to be some consistency. You got to peel back, everybody. You got to peel back the banana all the way to see what's going on. You got to be careful. Another comment. Wherever and whenever power, money, fame, control, or self-advancement is present or possible, there you will find a personal agenda and or a collective agenda at work to succeed. Is that not a true statement? Yes. Do you understand that the only way that life really works right is a life that operates under the fear of God? Because the Bible says, by the way, when you make a deal with somebody and you shake hands on it and you say this is a deal, the Bible says if something goes wrong, you should keep your deal even if it winds up hurting you. The Bible says don't break your word. Don't break the handshake. What I just said to some of you could have been in, in Swahili and you never would have understood a word I just said. That's just like, what? What was that? Yep. Can you imagine? In, 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 this, in this era that we live in, 
applying God's principles, if you shake on it or you say, I'll be there or I'll do it, and then you find out that you can get it a little bit more from this guy over here. You've already told that person you would do it. According to God, he holds you accountable. Keep your word. Yeah, but I'm going to make another extra thousand if I break the deal and make it with this guy. God says, keep your word. The moment that you change like that, your word can be bought and you have zip integrity. Everybody may see you one way, but you look at yourself in the mirror and you know. And God knows. The Christian should be the most steadfast, the most predictable employee, business owner, manager, whatever it might be, husband, wife, I've given you my word, till death do us part. And God heard that, so make it work. Simple as that, make it, make it work. So I want to read this, here it is, here it is. So words matter, and their definitions matter. People for 2024, definitions are going to be a big deal. It's not so much the words. Remember, I mean, words do matter. But what we've got, listen, things have gotten so cuckoo that now it's not even the words you use. It's what do you mean by that? It's definitions now. Five years ago, it was words. Because we all kind of use the same dictionary. Now it's like, what does that mean? I love you. What does that mean? Isn't that something? I agree. What does that mean? We've got to ask for a definition. So here it comes. Here's the test. Here's the part that I told you is going to test you. Remember, I love you. <laughs> Don't say anything, please. Be, be silent. Ponder it. Who is God? That's going to be asked a lot in 2024. Who is God? Next. What is a gender? See, listen, this is dangerous stuff. And everything I'm going to bring up to you has to do with Scripture. What is your worldview? What, in other words, what value system operates your life? What does the truth, or what does the word truth mean to you? Will you be voting this year? Think of that one. So I don't want to think about that. This is, I told you, I'm warning you right now that I love you. <laughs> Who is Jesus Christ? That's the ultimate one, of course. Listen. Is it legal or is it illegal to illegally enter into another country? <laughs> oh, listen, this, this, this started war. It shouldn't. I'm trying to contain myself right now in all honesty. I'll tell you why. This last year, uh, I don't know. Canada, I was in Canada, England, Switzerland. Did you know what? I couldn't, I couldn't get into those countries without incredible scrutiny. <laughs> Did you know that before I left LAX airport, I didn't know this, but those countries in the European Union, and including England, I had to put my face in front of a camera, and they took a picture of my face, and then getting, when I, when I landed in Heathrow, did you know, they didn't even ask for my passport, they didn't even stamp it, I just walked up, and the guy didn't even look at me, the guy, the customs agent is looking at a screen. And I'll eat, watch, there was, a green, there was a red and green light up here, and there, he had a hand. <laughs> and he's, I walk up, and he goes like this. And I was in. But I gave my total identity away. Got to Switzerland, walked right into the country, because the guy never even looked at me. He looked at the screen and goes just like this. Same, same was true getting out. Coming back to the United States, LAX stood in line for I don't know how long, over an hour. Next. And show the passport, all the, looking, scans the passport, looks at us. Where have you been? 
I'm not joking. All the scrutiny. You see, that's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. It should apply to everybody, but it's a good thing. You say, oh, I don't like that. I don't like the tone of your voice. <laughs> My point is this. In the war of 2024, logic goes out the window. Sanity goes out the window. I can't walk into Switzerland without giving my identity away. That's, a, that's normal. It's been going on for thousands of years. What's up? I leave that for you to figure out. What's up? What is your opinion of war? If you had to write a paper on it, what would you write? What is your opinion on religion? What kind of a paper would you write about that? What is your view on and your opinion on politics? What is your opinion on Mickey Mouse? <laughs> I said don't make any comments about, just listen right now. We don't need to hear about how deceptive of a rodent he is now. and We don't need to hear about his dark web antics and... I don't know, I'm not even sure. Does he have, does he wear his, does Mickey Mouse wear pants? I'm not even sure anymore. Neither are you right now. It's not the same Mickey I grew up with. But we're not going to talk about Mickey Mouse right now. Who was George Washington? Do you know who that was? Do you know what he was about? And watch this. Every name that was focused on, or thing that was focused on, caused you to have a little bit of a heart tick up or down, didn't matter. Maybe neutral, not now. According to all the researchers, this next one causes an emotional reaction regarding people in the American culture today. And they went on to say, by the way, it's uniquely American culture. It doesn't happen anywhere else. So whatever I'm going to say to you is a uniquely an American disease. Because Mexico doesn't have this reaction. Canada doesn't have this reaction. England, Peru, they don't have this reaction. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, listen to this. The most emotionally charged reactive word or words in the American culture today are two words. Donald Trump. <laughs> listen to you. Donald Trump causes people to literally go, hmm, whatever, to they start busting veins and they actually lose their minds. Somewhere, somewhere. And then when you ask them, one, in one way or the other, why is he great or why, is he, why, why do you hate him? Um, people stumble about answering. It's almost, listen, and I, 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 I'm going to say this now. I'm saving it for next week, but I'm just going to say it now. Um, <laughs> That conclusion really offended me. I have to tell you why. That the most volatile name in America, it's not Jesus. It's not Jesus. It's Donald Trump. The most divisive. Splits the nation right down the middle. Worldviews, ideologies, you name it. Boom. Oddly enough, the data is showing that your ethnicity doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Now, don't think this is a tear down or an endorsing of. What I'm trying to draw to your conclusion about is that we are in a year of an election. And you are going to see deception fly like you've never seen it fly before. It's going to be supersonic. And some people are so thin-skinned and irrational that they can't even handle the name Barack Obama, Joe Biden, Ted Cruz, or of course Donald Trump. They just go into fit. Something's wrong with them. On either side. Let's be honest. Be very careful that you're led by the Spirit of God in these days. And so I wrote this to myself. It's in my notes online. You can have those if you want. It's through there. But I said, I said, how is it that the most persecuted person in America isn't a Christian? I think he believes in God, but he's not a Christian. Sorry to burst your bubble. It's not a monk. It's not a priest. Sadly, it's not even a pastor. It's Trump. 
This is an embarrassment and an indictment against all pastors in the United States, including myself. If I say something about abortion, the American flag, Jesus Christ, patriotism, America, uh, making, making America godly again, nobody cares. If I mention the word Trump, people begin to have an allergic reaction. <laughs> and I'm very jealous and envious of his power to influence. I wish I could do that for Jesus. People will tolerate me anywhere. No one's trying to keep me uh, off, of, off of a ballot or whatever. Look what's going on. What's happening? Donald Trump is like a King Darius or, or, or uh, Cyrus in the Old Testament. He is like the canary in a cage. Everything that can be thrown at him has been thrown at him. But forget about him. There might be a day, if Donald Trump were to go away, maybe then they'll start attacking pastors. But according to the Bible, righteousness should be under attack. You say, are you calling Donald Trump righteous? No. But when he says that he stands for this or that, he stands for Israel's defense, he stands for the unborn child, they, he just, it's hated. The pastor should be at least, I mean, Franklin Graham's name should have been at the top. It would be an honor. You know, it's an honor to be hated by the right people, everybody. Jesus said, if you live for me and if you know me, you're going to be hated by the world. Does anybody hate you for what's right? Yes. First John chapter 4, verse 1. 1 John 4, 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God Every spirit that, watch, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. That is the incarnation of God. Verse 3, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Wow. Number three, the war of 2024 is against the faith. It's against the faith, not faith. It's not against, are you guys okay? We're almost done. It's not against faith. It's against the faith. The most precious thing that you own, my friend, you've heard me say this time and time again, cannot be bought. It cannot be inherited. It cannot be earned because it's not of this world. And I'm talking about your faith. Your faith is the most precious thing that you own. When faith is lost or broken or neglected or rejected, the very core existence of man is also lost and broken. When this happens, there will be no direction or meaning or purpose or reason for living. When you have no faith in someone or something greater than yourself, you lose hope. You lose direction. But if your faith is in Jesus Christ and him alone, then you're secure. Amen. You'll do awesome in 2024. You will war the great warfare victoriously because you know who you are and you know to whom you belong. Amen. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Watch this. The evidence. You ever think about evidence and faith being in the same sentence? The Bible does. The evidence of things not seen. There's invisible things that you don't see that are true and Faithworthy. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. Verse 3. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. God spoke the physical universe into existence. And you say, well, what do I do about that? Write these down. We'll go very quick because I'm out of time. 2 Corinthians 10, beginning at verse 4. This is what you do about it. What do I do about my faith in 2024? Know this, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or of this world, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Next step in warfare is this, 1 Timothy 1, 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made 
concerning you, that's Timothy, that by them you may wage the good warfare. In other words, what spiritual things were spoken over your life? Go live it, Timothy, and you're going to be successful. And go out there and fight what is wrong and advance the gospel and stand for what's right and true. That's very militant. Speak up. Thank God you and I live in a country where that's all we really need to have to do is speak up. The Bible commands this of us. It's not an option. Romans chapter 13, verse 12. The night is far spent. Notice the contrast. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. That's where, by the way, this is one of the verses where you get the imminency, the doctrine of imminency. Some people say that's not in the Bible. The word imminency is not in the Bible. Neither is the word Bible in the Bible. The Bible teaches that you are to be ready to meet God at any time, and you, you are to be busy about his business. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of God. That's what we're going to do in 2024. Next, Jude chapter 1, verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the what? Faith, Faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. Know your doctrine. What is it that you believe? 1 Peter 3.15, you all know this. 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks of you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. Beautiful. Powerful. You need to make sure that you have these. Again, if you don't have these notes, you can download them. But these things should be our marching orders for 2024, the Bible. Number four is the war of 2024 is against the church. In fact, can I say it this way? The war has always been against the church. In 2024, it appears to me the way that this war has been trending against, watch my fingers, air quotes, the church, I think the world is going to win this year against the church. Now, I'm not talking about Jesus' church. There's a big difference. <laughs> Organized church? It's done. It's done. Remember, I love you guys. <laughs> but God loves his church and he loves his people. Jesus loves his church like a husband loves his wife. In James chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Wow. God loves his church. We love each other, but the world is against us. So what's the fix? Well, what can I do about it? This is what you can do about it. The church is to be recognized as the foundation of truth. And I know that's hard to believe these days because the church is so anemic and silent. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15 Paul says, but if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. My gosh, that is so amazing that if we believe that, the church is so dressed in love but in light at the same time that the church says, you know what? This line right here, you shall not pass. With your pornography, you will not pass. You will not take our children. The line is drawn here. You stay there, my kids stay here. You will not. On and on it goes. The church. Let me give you a little tip. Somebody's not going to want to hear this. Where there's no church alive, there's a massive government control. All around the world throughout human history. Did you know that in 1690 in England, you, the country was so broke from it prosecuting its wars that it created a window tax? And they went around all of England, and if you had a view from your house of the river or of the ocean or of the fields, they said, you have to pay for that view. And if you didn't want to pay, they boarded up your view. They boarded up your window. Did you know that? Listen, that was a state church 
in cahoots with the government, and people had no freedom or liberty. Think of that for a moment. Does that sound familiar? When the government is trying to make Chick-fil-A work on Sundays? Is that amazing? All of a sudden, it's their business. Wow, how does that happen? It's going to keep happening unless a church takes its rightful place to speak of. we got to say what's right, not silence. Silence is agreement with evil. Silence is compliance. The church on earth is the presence of Christ on earth. 1 John 4, 17. 1 John 4, 17. Love has been perfected among us that in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Wow. The church is the manifest love of God on earth. John 13, 35. By this all will know that you are my disciples for if you love or your love for one another. Is that awesome? The church also is the preserving agent in the world. John chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, Jesus said, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. Think about how dumb that would be. Light the torch and put a basket on top of the flame. You burn your house down. But you put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. Verse 16, let your light, let it go. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And then unity. The church is the example of unity. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Paul says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. How's that going to happen? Reading the one-year Bible. I know you've already stumbled on a day or two. It's okay. Start today. Get up and start again every day. If you've missed a day, start today. And that there be no divisions among you, schisms. Uh, you could say personality cults, by the way but that you do perfectly join together in the same mind and in the same judgment. The church should be the most unified powerhouse on the block. And then last and final, does it seem like we've been here forever? Is that clock working? I'm tired and it's first service. <laughs> Has it been a long time? I'm getting sick of myself. So if you're saying, man, when are you gonna shut up? I'm thinking the same thing. No, I'm telling you, this has been a long day. Very strange. I don't know, like a time thing going on? It just moved. I did see the clock move. Okay, here we go. F fifth and final thing is this. The war of 2024 is against marriage. We're going to be marching down these things today and next Sunday against marriage. Boy, it doesn't take a spiritual Einstein to figure this one out. Marriage is a joke. It's even a game show stuff now, or reality programs, or whatever. Oh, you, I, and please, I'm going to, I know I'm going to be wrong, because I don't watch it, but stuff like, oh, they haven't, they've never met each other, and they're on this show, and they're going to get married, and then they're going to, then they're going to meet each other. And it, it who, who thought this up? Some, some producers to make money, to do an experiment on someone's, frankly, somebody's dumb life. If you're that dumb, to subject yourself to a television producer that have you go through this sampling of women or of men to, to find your, your husband or your wife? Are you crazy? But it's okay. That's what marriage has been reduced to. doesn't matter. That's why they're doing it. By the way, there are just a few foundational institutions created by God in all of, all of time and eternity. And one of them is marriage. There's only a few. Marriage, the church, Israel, he says. Very, very few. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, I love that. If you don't like, I don't like that. Well, take it up with God. This is what God said. <laughs> Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. By the way, that's man, man is saying that now today with AI. And um, a human, what's it called? The, you know, mating together of electronics to human, what's it called? Transhumanism. Transhumanism. 
Yeah, which I love Elon Musk, but he's taken that a little too far there already. Um, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air. That's beautiful. And over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Isn't that amazing? Like Dr. Doolittle, man, right? We were supposed to be friends with all the animals. The snakes were supposed to come up and, you know, and, you know, the giraffe. You're supposed to, like, you get a gut gut on the back of a giraffe. Can you imagine that thing? As long as you don't fall off, it'd be an amazing ride, right? (laughs) So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male? Oh, goodness gracious. (laughs) Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. Let's see if this is a good idea. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Um, (laughs) Genesis chapter 2, verse 20. So Adam gave names to all cattle to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was no, or uh, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Uh, That's really good news. The word can be translated, there was no helper found that fit him. Thank God. You understand that? Man, where are you? Man, you should thank God for your wife and thank God for women. You know, Satan hates women. That's why they're pimped out and prostituted and trafficked. Satan hates them. By the way, if the whole world was full of men, that'd last about an hour. (laughs) We'd all kill each other. We'd all kill each other about the rams today playing the goats, about who's going to win. We have to have women in our lives. We don't do well on our own. God knew that. Adam's standing there. There goes Mr. and Mrs. Giraffe. There goes Mr. and Mrs. Kangaroo. There goes Mr. and Mrs. Hippo. And he's just like... (laughs) Feeling a little lonely here, God. And God basically said, don't worry about it. None of these fit. I, I, I have someone prepared for you. That's awesome. Incredible. Lost my place. Where was I? I need, I need to get you out of here, though. I need, it's been too long of a... I'm going home after this. Which, where am I? 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place, and then the rib which the Lord God had made from man, he made into a woman, and he brought, for, he brought her... To the man, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, get out of mom and dad's house, (laughs) and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they shall, and then they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Absolutely awesome. And then, so what do we do with this? Here's, here's the deal. This is, this is what the so what is on this. Uh, the world is against marriage, and that means, friends, listen up real quick. That means there's a demonic power and the world ganging up on you to attack your mind and your relationship so that Satan breaks up your home life. Because next week, we'll talk about boys and girls. But in Ephesians, let's all stand, you can stand. In Ephesians chapter 5, listen to this, Ephesians 5 verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands. God bless you, have a, have a great day, see ya. <laughs> no, but that's, what, but that's what it feels like, right? That, you got to admit, that's what it feels like. Wives, submit to your own husbands, clue, as to the Lord, watch, For the husband is the first one to be sacrificed, is what the word head means. He's the head of the wife. What does that mean? He's the one that goes down first. He's the one that bleeds first. He's the one that uh, dies first. He's the one that is sacrificed because love sacrifices. When you find a man like that, you'll be very happy about verse 22. Just find a man like that, will you? And don't settle for less. 
So also is Christ head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Verse 24, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, look, here's the qualifier. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word. Men, read the Bible over your wife. Tuck her into bed, stand alongside her, read the Bible. And he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are the members of his body. Think about it. Husbands and wives are the members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. And so, Father, we pray today in this glorious war. I'm going to call it a glorious war because there's a glorious cause. The souls of men and women, boys and girls are at stake. And all that is of God is under attack. That being true fortifies us. It confirms so much to us. Thank you, Lord. None of this has caught you off guard and none of it needs to catch us off guard if we know your word. So, Father, I pray your spirit would be upon all of these here right now and, God, that you would, above all things, we just read really the description of what Jesus did when he embraced the cross. He died at the cross, on the cross, for our sins. He laid down himself. He's the head. He's the one to be submitted to. But what did he do? He died on the cross for our sins. And he rose again from the dead. And that demands our repentance. Our repentance from our evil, our sin, from having a crummy marriage because we won't work at it. Lying about the truth. Not caring about the facts. Having no regard for the church. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would possess these, your people, by the power of your Holy Spirit, and that the forces of darkness would tremble because of them in 2024. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.